When you guys see superheroes, you wanna see where did they come from? Is there a path of success that I can follow? What was the thing that sparked you? What was that moment? Like you tell me you did a good job, Yeah. I'm, I could die happy. My thought before all this was that financial freedom meant I needed to have millions in the bank mm -hmm. so that whenever I had anything I had to pay for, I could just pay cash for it. That's so interesting. And so like that was the first time that I thought like financial freedom was actually achievable. You wanna hear the best credit repair hack? Yes. In the world? Yes. All right, guys, I have Henry Washington with us today. I wanna do an origin story. This guy is like, uh, a freaking superhero to a lot of people. Last night we go to dinner at Mastro's. That's a very Jamil type of restaurant, by the <laughs> yeah, way. I, was, I wasn't confused. I know who picked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was definitely not me. I mean, I, I'm always like, okay, Jamil, we're going to dinner with Jamil. We're going to go to Mastro's. But when I choose, we'll usually go to like Mexican food or yeah. something a little bit more low key. Yeah, something normal. Something normal. Right. Right. Like not $350 caviar. Right. Absolutely. G guys, tease Jamil DMG in his Instagram DMs and say, and say 350 caviar, 350 caviar. <laughs> okay. Go blow him up. But today we're going to learn um, why did somebody stop Henry right when we walked into Mastro's of Scottsdale? He's from Arkansas. Why did somebody stop him is because he's recognized. And when you guys see superheroes, you want to see where did they come from? Is there a path of success that I can follow, a similar path that I can follow to get to where he is? Not so much from the recognition standpoint, but he's recognized because he's accomplished things. He's doing deals. He's making money in real estate. That's his full-time endeavor. And for a lot of people that are watching right now, they're saying, I want to get into real estate full-time, Yep. right? So where was the moment where Henry Washington says, I want to get into real estate. I don't know how. What was the thing that sparked you? What was that moment? It was at 3 a.m. on a random weeknight because I had a panic attack. Woke up sweating, breathing hard, freaking out, thinking my heart was jumping out of my chest. Um, and I got to that panic attack because up until that point in my life, I felt like I did all the things everybody told me I was supposed to do. I went to, I got good grades in high school, uh, so I can get into college, got into good college, got good grades in college, got a technical degree so that I can get a good job, making good money from the start, got a technical job, started making great money, was making six figures, designing software, doing data analytics. And I didn't, I did not know this already. I did not know you were a software designer. Yeah. What? Yeah. Wow. Design software, data analytics. Did all kinds of cool stuff. Did modeling and simulation for the Navy and NATO. It was, I did all kinds of cool stuff. So I was making good money and I would still find myself in a place, you know, you get paid every two weeks and about a week and a half in, I'm like, all right, I got four or five more days before I get paid. How many ramen noodles do I got to eat to make it? Even at six figures. Paid? Even at six figures. I had no financial education, right? And so, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, you, you come from nothing and you, and you turn into something. I ain't come from nothing. Uh, upper middle class upbringing. My parents worked hard to give me a phenomenal life and to give me the opportunities that they didn't have. Some of the falling out of that is that I liked nice things mm -hmm. and didn't realize how hard my parents had to work to be able to get those things for me. And so when I got my job and got out of school, I felt like these are just, this is just what I buy. I buy a nice car and I live in the nicest apartment that I can possibly have, right? Because I like comfortable things. It's what I'm used to. I didn't have the financial education that would tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, why don't you take a step back just in case, right? Just in case. Just in case you don't feel like eating ramen noodles for this. It's, it's an interesting thing, right. man. I love I love this because it's refreshing, number yeah. one. A lot yeah. of people don't tell this story, right? Yeah. It's like, I was this, I was struggling this, yeah. da, 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 da. I actually respect this story in, in a lot of ways yeah. way more. One, the honesty. And yeah. then two, I think a lot more people are going to be able to right. relate to this, mm -hmm. is that my parents worked really hard. And my, because your parents are probably working so hard, they didn't have time to sit down with you and go, hey, and they're yeah. also working nine to five jobs, I imagine. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Okay. So they don't have the ability to bring you to work and go, all right, right, Henry, let me show you what I do. Let me show you why this is important. Let me show you blah, 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 blah. Right. And your parents get home from a long day at work and they're like, I want to spend time with the kids rather than go, hey, let's sit down and go right. through financial education. Right. Absolutely. A lot more people can relate to that than, right. um, you know, being beaten for a you right. know, right. When, when you're a child. Right. So your parents were phenomenal, worked nine to five jobs, obviously very smart people. You go from a moment of like, it's really weird as humans, we get really entitled and you'll yeah. agree with this. 
when I lived in, I lived in Korea, I slept on the floor. I was a missionary. And then I, as I scaled, I get home and I like sleep in a nicer mattress. I sleep in a nicer mattress. Yeah. You get to a point where like, I'm not staying in any hotel that's not four star. <laughs> right. Yes. But yes. The, you know, five years prior, you're like happy with a two star hotel. Right. You're just happy that you could afford it. So we get entitled incredibly fast. And so for you, you are somewhat entitled to like this mm -hmm. nice lifestyle, not lavish, right. but nice lifestyle that you're like, oh, that apartment is two thousand five hundred dollars a month, yeah. and I'm by myself. Yeah. Done. By myself, three bedrooms. Sure, yeah. I don't, it's, really? It was a two bedroom with a loft. Damn, guys, this guy's balling yeah, out. It was a townhouse. I was going nuts, man. It all was, by yourself. All by myself. Wow. Okay, I love it. All by myself, right? And so I was. I mean, I just I spent my money, man. I either ate my money or I spent it on lifestyle stuff, like traveling, doing yeah. anything like that. Yeah, nice clothes. Nice car. Nice, nice car. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Are and, we dating at this point? Are we well, married at this point? So what happened was. Uh, I met my wife mm -hmm. and then we got married fast. So we met and then 365 days later, we got married to like, the day. What? To the day. That was on purpose. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We picked the date on purpose. Yeah. It wasn't like you guys got Absolutely. married and go, wait, what day is it today? <laughs> oh, snap. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it, was, it was very planned. Um, so that's a fast transition, right? Right. But like your financial landscape doesn't transition that fast, no. right? And so what I learned is that even though I, as a single guy, was, let's I mean, let's call it what it was, I was comfortable having to eat ramen until I got to my next paycheck. Because if I wasn't, I would have fixed it, right? Well, what I found out when I got married was that women don't eat, eat ramen. Does, that wasn't a, that wasn't gonna guys. Happen. This is a little known fact, but women are allergic to ramen noodles. Just so you know. <laughs> So she was like, we can't live like this. We can't spend all of our money and then figure out how we're going to eat for a few days until we get paid again. And so that was like wake up call number one. Wake up call number two was we tried to buy a house together again. Following... Were you defensive in this uh, when she no. approached you though? No, absolutely not. She was right. I just needed somebody to pull me out of my crap. I, I love this though, because there's a lot of yeah. men that women yeah. want to say, yo, yo, yo. Yeah. We got to watch this and they get defensive. Yeah. And they're like, I'm the one, that, I'm the one make, out there making money. Guys, don't be like that. I made twice as much as she did. She was right, though. She was right. No, nah, no. Um, yeah, man. So then we tried to buy a house together. Hmm. All right, because that's the next step in the American dream blueprint, right? And um, I remember the bank called me. The lender called me and said, hey, if you want your wife to be able to buy a house, you can't be on this. You're going to ruin this for her. You're joking. Dead serious. Bro. Dead serious. How old are you at this point? I was, let's see, we were married seven years, so I was probably 32, something so like that. So at 32 years old, you're yeah. making more than six figures. Yeah. A banker calls you and tells you, you're going to ruin your wife's dream of owning a house if yep. your name is on this. 100% that's what happened. <laughs> Big blow to my ego. Like I, still, like, I still feel that in my gut, like that phone conversation you're gonna have to like release that trauma yeah. at some yeah, point. Right, right. and so um you know i obviously took my name off of it and had to swallow that pill took the of, like feeling like you know i wanted to be this provider and here she was holding me up right so we bought the house and she let me live in it right like that's that's what happened wow that's what happened and so that was a big wake up call and so that's what led, and then that led to the final straw, which was... Now, oh, there's a lot of people that do this, but I just want to point out to other people that are from a traditional background, or maybe people that are not from a traditional background. Like, we as blue-collar boys, yeah. growing up growing up in a blue-collar family, like or even, mm -hmm. even middle class, upper middle class, we pride ourselves in one thing, our work ethic and our ability to provide. That's right. Like, you tell me I'm a, I've been working hard is the greatest compliment you could ever give me. Yes. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about my nice car, my this, my that. Like you tell me you did a good job. Yeah. I'm I could die happy. When my wife tells me thank you for all the hard work that oh, you're doing, bro. that melts me. Right. Yeah. So we come from that same upbringing. So when somebody tells you you can't be on the loan, yeah. That's devastating. I was I was embarrassed. I was angry. Well, I have nobody else to be angry at. It was they were right. Like, right. Like, I, was I it because I, you were it was, it was my, not building credit, or credit. you had bad credit? Bad. Like you had late payments, stuff like that. I had all, all like you were days. nonchalant. Like you had a credit card, and you're like, I'll pay. You know, forget yeah. about it or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'll pay it, and then when I do get some money, I'll pay what I feel like paying. Right. Whatever. Like I just, I'll pay enough that I can maintain this. You were casual that I have. about it. You were just yeah. casual about it. That's I wasn't going to sacrifice my lifestyle to pay my debts. Mm. Right. 
I just was, I was, I was wrong. I was wrong. Uh, so yeah, that was a big blow. And then we did the other thing married couples do, which is you have conversations about your future, right? You, you dream together. And so we were having a conversation one night before bed about what our dream home would look like and how many kids we would have and, you know, cool vacations we wanted, places we wanted to visit. And that's supposed to be a fun talk. And I was playing the role that it was a fun talk, but inside I was freaking out. Cause I'm like a dream house. I couldn't, I couldn't even be on this house. Like how, how am I and like, we're barely making the payment. Like, how am I going to get her to a dream house? Bro, she deserves it. There's that moment of like helplessness when you're yeah. going through this, where you're like, who's going to, how is it, who's going to give me the opportunity to yeah. go and better myself type yeah. of thing. Right. Yeah, you man. were feeling helpless. I was feeling helpless and super scared because it was a feeling of helplessness. And then, you know, we're men, we get irrational sometimes about our thoughts. And so I was like, at some point she's going to realize that like, I ain't that dude. Like I'm not going to make this money and she deserves these things. So she's going to leave me and she can have better. And so I was just, my head was everywhere. And I went to bed and woke up at three in the morning in a full on panic attack. Wow. Because I was like, I can't, I don't know how to give her what she deserves and she's going to figure it out at some point. And so I did what any <laughs> red blooded person would do at three in the morning when you're freaking out about money. So I started Googling, how can I make some extra money? Cause I was like, at least if I can find a side hustle or something to make some extra money, that'll ease the blow and then I'll figure the rest out. And so I started Googling and I just started to see words that I never paid attention to before words like passive income. I didn't know what I'd never I didn't know what that meant. So I started researching what passive income was and I was like, okay, started seeing words like cash flow and appreciation and, and I was like, yeah, these are definitely words you don't yeah. learn in like yeah. high school or college, right. especially in like a technical right. college, you know? And so um, I started seeing like, and all of the, like the common denominator amongst all the articles and things I was reading was that like real estate gets you all these things. Mm. And I was like, well, it seems far-fetched. And then I watched this video, it was a TED talk, it was this kid. It was called How to Design Your Dream Life Through Passive Income. And when you're freaking out about money at three in the morning and some kids telling you how to design your dream life, you, you watch that video, right? <laughs> and so I watch it and this kid- TED Talks are bomb. Yeah, bro. man, yeah, man. <laughs> people, like, people have, TED Talks have caused, it's like this ripple effect. A TED Talk caused somebody to change the world and then they did a TED Talk about it, which caused somebody to change the world. It's crazy. Yeah. So I, uh, I watch it and this kid, the way he's explaining it, I'd never thought about before. He's talking about financial freedom. And he was like, look, it's not as crazy as people think it is. Like. You know, like my thought before all this was that financial freedom meant I needed to have millions in the bank mm -hmm. so that whenever I had anything I had to pay for, I could just pay cash for it. Right. Just millions in the bank. That's so interesting. I never I, I haven't really thought about that. That's how it was for me, too. Yeah. It was like I need to have a big chunk of money that you live off of. Yeah. Millions in the bank. That way, whenever I want something, I can just pay the cash for it and I don't have to worry about anything. else. It's silly to say it out loud now. <laughs> But when people say stuff like get your financial literacy right, get your mindset right, yeah. those were just catchphrases to me 20 years ago. Right. But now they're like, that. it's everything. It's all the things. So when he framed it up, basically what he was saying is, look, just do the math. What do you pay for every month? What's your phone bill cost? What's your, like, what's your life's expenses? He was like, if you can generate that much money in passive income, technically you don't have to go to work. You're financially free. And I was like, well, damn, that seems way more achievable. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did the math when well, I woke up in the morning and finally did a budget to see where my money was going. And I was like, well, I don't really have that much in expenses. And a lot of this I can cut back on. And so like, that was the first time that I thought like financial freedom is actually achievable. And real estate seems like the option everybody's doing. And if this kid at 20 something years old figured it out, like I'm a smart guy, I can figure this out. It's all solvable. I couldn't be on the loan because my credit was bad. I'm just fix my credit. So I dove into fixing my credit. Like I woke up that morning and I told my wife, I was like, we're going to be real estate investors. And she was like, all right, we'll be real estate investors. But then I started to put everything into action. I found a credit repair company to help me figure out what to pay, what not to pay, how to get my score improved. And I had that working in the background. I contacted a friend of mine who was a broker. Cause I didn't, that's a, that's a yeah. tough moment though, bro. Yeah. When you're like, you're, uh, I just went through a credit repair thing yeah. now. 
Yeah. Okay. So the last 700 assets I bought yeah. didn't use credit. Yeah. So now we're refinancing a bunch of stuff and my, and my operate, my operations manager's like, Hey, you have like a 680 credit score. <laughs> I go from what? And you know, I've got like Amexes, I've got car loans and stuff. And she's like, one of your car loans was paid three days late last year. And then something a couple of years ago, you paid it late as well. I was like, I'm not the one that pays the bill. She's like, well, your bookkeeper screwed it up. You got late payments and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I, at this stage of the game, I got to go fix my credit. Yeah. It's a deflating moment. Yeah. And so you have to just bite that bullet and go figure it out. I had to do it. I made some tough decisions, right? I, I tell people, you want to hear the best credit repair hack yes. in the world? Yes. Here's what you do. This is an Instagram reel right here, Eric. Here's the best credit repair hack in the world. You go and you pull your credit report. You can use one of them free sites, free credit report, whatever it is. Get yourself a credit report. Go through that thing. Start looking through it. And then find where you owe some stuff and then pay that shit. <laughs> Start Is paying that simple? some stuff. Right, because here's, here's the thing. I get it. There's some people who have some insurmountable credit debt. Right. That's not what I'm talking about. Right. But for me and for a lot of people, I had some stuff on there that was like an old Verizon bill mm -hmm. where I'd shut it off and then they kept billing me and then I felt like they were in the wrong and they felt like yeah, I, like was I wasn't wrong. even using the service. Oh, well, F I'm you. I'm not paying you that $200, right? And so it just sat on my credit report. It's in collections, hurting me month over month. Right. Right. Like I still don't agree that it was my responsibility, but now that $200 was standing in the way of my financial freedom. Right. Paid that crap. Right. Had another one from an apartment that I lived in. They replaced the carpets after I moved out and then billed me for it. And I felt mm. like, well, seven people lived there before me. Why don't you divide that seven ways, right? Like, I'm not paying for that carpet, your new carpet. Right. Paid it. Right? Because those things were stopping me. There are tons of people out there right now who've got some of that stuff on their credit. Their pride. They're prideful about it. And they don't want to pay it because they don't feel they have to. Just pay that crap. Fix your credit. It's stopping you from getting to your freedom. Right. So I did that. I paid the, the stuff that I felt like I didn't have to pay to just end that situation. I worked with a credit repair company to help get some of the negative items off my credit. And I just started to work that in the background. And then I said, all right, I decided at three in the morning, I made a decision that I was going to be a successful real estate investor. So what does that mean? It means I got to go figure out how. And I said, I have no idea how. But every house around here, somebody owns, somebody's invested in real estate. Let me just find them. So I started Googling groups. Seems like an appropriate meetups. thing to do. I just wanted to be around people doing it. I pace, I found every real estate meetup, group, club, bike circle, book club. Like if <laughs> investors were doing Biking something. Biking for dollars. Right. I got <laughs> around them. I just wanted to see like osmosis like just learn how people are doing see how people are doing it and so i went to every meetup and um like consistently and i think that's where people screw up with meetups is they go to a couple and then life happens right i got this thing it's like going to the gym yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. right i was relentlessly consistent about it i was at every meetup and then I started to develop these relationships with these investors. And I was super intentional about what I would do in those meetups, who I would talk to, where I would sit. I wanted to be front and center. I don't want to go sit in the back. I want to go sit right up front where either the people who know the most or are doing the most are sitting or where the people who are like the speakers will be sitting. Like I was, I wanted to be in the mix because I want to learn by osmosis, right? And what, what that did that I didn't realize it was doing was it was giving everybody else in the room this idea that I was already a successful investor. Wow. People just assumed that I was doing deals. And so when people would talk to me, they'd be like, oh, well, how many properties do you have? I'm like, oh, I've never done a deal. You've never done a deal? And that just made people want to help me more because yeah. I was so into it that they were like, well, we got to get you there, right? Wow. Um, so that's how I started to learn the business. And then I was podcast books anytime. Like I lived, like was there a, Was there a... a first podcast or something yep. you were listening to. Yep. The first podcast uh, that really resonated with me was Danny Johnson's uh, old podcast. Flipping, I never, Flipping I never Junkie. listened to that. Flippingjunkie.com. Well, Danny was an old software guy who had turned into a real estate investor. And so I was, but it just resonated with me because that's what I did. And so what was his strategy? Fix, fixing. And he flipping? was a fix and flipper, um, direct to seller marketing hmm. to into fix and flips. And that, so it taught me a lot about how to find deals, right? Are you, is that your primary source is direct to seller? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's really hard. So Jamil and I mm -hmm. spent a lot of time together. Yeah. 
And I don't get to talk about direct to seller because I'm direct to seller. Yeah. Right. So where yeah. I'm probably I'm now forty percent direct to seller. Yeah. Because just the brand has gotten to a point where yeah. I buy a lot of deals for my students or right. whatever. But for the first several years of my business, it was ninety percent direct to seller. Yeah. And Jamil, all his ads are yeah. direct to seller stupid. Right. And if you do direct to seller, you're, you're stupid. Yeah. And you should get the Henrys and the Paces of the world to right. do direct to seller and then buy their deals. Right. And um, so it's it's nice to have a direct to seller guy. Oh yeah, I'm a direct to seller. I've I've probably bought, I know I've bought only two deals from wholesalers ever. Really? And I've bought one deal on the market. Everything else has been. Ooh, I like I like this. This is really great. It's yeah. in. What's interesting about that is that everybody is so diverse, and there is no right way to do it. Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways. There is a right way. Yeah. Here's what I mean by that. You, there's a right way that resonates with you. That's. 100%. And so I call that your avatar. So I, I broke I broke out 19 different avatars. So if you guys want to go watch the avatar series on my YouTube channel, I have avatar. So avatar number one is direct to seller um, um, visionary. Yep. So you're a visionary. I'm a visionary. You're direct to seller. You're the guy that's going to be on the phone yep. for your first couple of deals, yep. you know, whatever. Then you have the direct to seller integrator. So my partner, Cody, doesn't want to be on the phone, but he's my partner, makes it just as much money as I do, yep. but he doesn't have to go negotiate. Then you've got other avatars like, you know, I'm gonna, I do a lot of wholesalers bring me their dead leads. I yeah. convert them into creative finance, stuff like that. And so you have to find out which one of these avatars really resonate with you. There is no right answer except right. for you as an individual. The secret sauce, man. They all work. They all work. Every single method works. Right. Right. They all work. So pick the one that you feel like fits your personality and your budget the best. If you can't, if you're gonna underfund a budget, a, a strategy, throwing money down the drain. Yeah, the, I think the, yeah. the downfall to direct to seller, we should do a yeah. video about this. We yeah. should do the benefits of the direct, direct to seller. Well, guys, we'll do that in the, in the next video with the Henry Washington series. And then we'll tell Jamila stupid. But yeah, we will. Yeah. We'll go through the pros and cons of a direct to seller marketing uh, business. Yeah. But so you you listen to Danny's podcast, you're going to podcast, your osmosis. Mm -hmm. Before we go into the next thing about like, what was your first deal? How important was the osmosis to you? It was everything. It was everything. And I didn't know it was until I had a deal on the line and I needed to leverage that network to learn what the crap to go do. So like being intentional as I was about putting myself around the people who were successful, asking them questions and like, like I needed to learn what a good deal looked like. I didn't know. So I just started asking investors like, Hey Pace, what's your, what's your last, what'd you, what was your last deal? Did you flip it? Did you rent it? And they, you know, investors will tell you, oh yeah, I bought this house down over off, you know, rainbow curve. And it was, I don't know, I paid like 250 for it. And I put 50 in it. And then I think we sold it for like 350 or something like that. And I got one around the corner from there. We bought for this. And then we were renting that one for like, they'll give you all the details, but that's gold. Right. Now, you know what neighborhoods they're buying in, what they're paying for their properties on average, how much they're putting into them, what their ROIs are, how long their contractors their are taking everything, all that stuff and who I their just, lenders are. Yeah. I'm making notes of all this stuff. I'm starting to learn. Okay. This is, this is the price point people are buying properties at typically. This is the percentage difference between what they're worth and what they're like. You're getting all this information. And then I had to go find a deal. And so, uh, you know, People look back now and they say, well, I got lucky to find my first deal. I say I positioned myself to be able to take advantage of the opportunity when it not. You don't get lucky when you put right. yourself in the right rooms right. and you put yourself around the right people and you get the energy and the vibration of being in a real estate meetup. Like I've bought so many deals because I've gotten probably four of my businesses I own today yeah. were because I would go to meetups yeah. consistently. Steve Trang's meetup. Yeah. I would go to his meetup consistently, like show up, show up, show yep. up. When I and then I got to a point where I was the speaker, and yep. I, you know, a lot. He would call me and come back. Hey, come speak, come speak, come speak. And people go, "Are you speaking tonight?" I'm like, "No, I'm not speaking tonight." And they're like, "Why are you here?" I'm like, "Cause I'm an investor too." Cause I'm trying to buy deals, baby. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to get private money lenders. I'm trying yeah. to get this. I'm trying to get contractors. I. Some of my best contractors came from yes. other people in the room. They're like, oh yeah, my plumber, he's amazing. He'll do this, this, and this. He has a cousin that works at yeah. Advanced Plumbing <laughs> Supply and he'll hook you up with the blah, blah, blah. It's like, you don't get these homie hookups when you don't have homies. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. Yep. So my other thing that I did, and I didn't realize how helpful these things were when I was doing them. Like I wasn't that, I wasn't that smart. But looking back, I can see the impact that they had. So I made a decision early on that I was just going to tell everybody that I was a real estate investor, 
and I decided that's how I was going to introduce myself to people. So when I would meet new people and they'd say, uh, you know, you know, who are you? And I'd say, I'm Henry Washington. I'm a real estate investor and I do data analytics and software development. Right. Cause I wanted, like, I've just always been a believer in like in the world you attract mm -hmm. like what you put out. Right. If you don't like what you're attracting, you're probably putting out something that's bringing those things to you. So you right. need to, you know, do some self-reflection. And I was like, I want, all the stuff investors have. So I'm just going to put out that that's why I am so that the world starts bringing me those things. And so I told people, isn't it weird investor. how li like literally literal you are being right now, but it see it sounds like fluff. Yeah. It, all, it yeah. is so literal guys. He is being so absolutely granular in the mm -hmm. detail of like, I, I want all the things that investors have. Yep. So I put it out there that this is what I want. And the world brings it to you. That's right. The vibrate. I'm a blue collar guy. Yep. I did not grow up this way. Right. And now that I'm older, I go, man, I wasted 10 years of my life thinking <laughs> I just have to go and find, I have to go and find it by myself instead of putting myself in the right places and, and attracting it with other people and, yep. and basically ringing other people's mental bells of like, this is what Pace wants. This is what Pace is needing. Ding, 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 ding. That's it. And I, I was just doing it all by myself. That's it. And it, you weren't lucky to get your first deal, bro. You freaking went in and put the work in. That's right. And it, but people don't see, they think it's fluff, right? And mm -hmm. I tell people like, so what if it is fluff? I'm not saying don't go hustle. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, why not hustle and put it out there that that's what you want? Now you're doing both. Okay, so here's what I think we should do. I don't think we should talk about your first deal in this video. I think yeah. we should talk about Henry Washington's first deal in the next video. And then we'll do, the last video we'll do is we'll talk about direct to seller pros and cons, yeah. okay? But, so you go do your first deal. Yep. In your guys' goals with you and your wife, we talked about this earlier, is that you said, I want to do five deals in five years. Yep. So you do five deals basically in five, in one month. Yes. Amazing. Yes. Okay, so we'll talk about those deals, but now um, here's my next question. Fast forward today. Let's skip over the first couple of deals you did. Fast forward to today. You've got a direct-to-seller business. Mm -hmm. So you've, you're doing cold calling. Cold calls, direct Texting, mail. direct mail. And PPC. Interesting. All right, cool. So um, some of those are expensive marketing mechanisms. That's correct. Right? Direct mail, PPC, inbound, yep. cold calling, outbound. Right. Good mix. Yep. I'm a fan. Love it. I'm a fan of, especially in your guys' market in Arkansas, mm -hmm. bro, mm -hmm. your, your direct mail probably dominates. That's why, that's why I do it, because I get a higher response rate than you're going to get here in Arizona, right? People are used to seeing mail from investors here. That's it's just like trash, 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 trash. In my market, we're still sending mail to people who've never seen investor mail. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Real estate is very market specific. Yep. Okay, so you, you get your first couple of deals done. Um, this is back obviously years ago. What is your main target now in your business? Are you fixing and flipping? Are you wholesaling? Are you holding? Yep. My approach right now is we direct the seller market relentlessly, consistently. We buy everything that's a deal and I keep the multis and sell the singles. Hmm. That's, that's what I'm looking to do with most of the deals. But now the market's telling me I might want to keep some of these singles too, because you're not going to quite get the return right. that you might've thought you were going to get when you put it under contract, but you are going to get some good rent. Okay. Yeah. Love it. So you you would either wholesale or fix and flip the singles. I would I close keep on the, everything. Keep I the multis. Wholesale. I just I hotel. Oh, you hotel everything. Yeah, we'll clean them out and stick them on the market. We'll repair the ones that the market says I need to fix. I think what mm -hmm. keeps people away from hoteling is their belief system and the and yes. their ability to have resources. <laughs> yes. Right? Because you can make an extra twenty, thirty thousand dollars a lot of times on a hotel deal versus yeah. a wholesale. Yeah. I mean, you're basically going, here, you deal with it because I have a lack of resources. Yep. Yeah. Um I don't want to wholesale it to you. I'm going to freaking hotel it because I have a hard money lender and a private money lender that yep. will let me just clean out the deal. And I'm into the no, the thing, no money out of pocket. That's right. But a brand new newbie goes, well, I don't understand that. What's a hard money lender versus a private money lender? And they're leaving 30 grand on the table because they don't know that one piece of information. Yeah. I open my buyer's pool up because if I wholetail it, that means I stick it on the market, but at a discounted price, mm -hmm. the investors still look at those and want to buy them. But you also get looks from people who say, I got to pay 10% interest. I could go try to buy this $300,000 house or I could buy your $200,000 house and mm. put the sweat equity into it yeah. and it'll be that $300,000 house, right? You get those buyers and there's a lot of them who, who are priced out of that $300,000 house now.
I love it. Okay, so let's wrap this up with a final question on this topic. What do you, where are you getting your education now? Because you're a student of the game. I'm a yep. student of the game. Are you getting it from buddies of yours at high levels? Are you in masterminds? Are you reading yep. specific books? Are there people you're paying to get in front of? Yep. What does that world look like now? Yep. So I'm in a I'm in a couple of different masterminds with other investors. The one where where I met you, right? The uh, uh, Tim's mastermind. So there's other investors in there I'm learning from, and then I have uh, I've got group chats on Instagram and on my phone of other investors all over the country, and we are constantly sharing advice and information and tips and tricks, and it's like that chat's constantly going. So I love, love that. The, the the investor group chat's a fun one, um, and then. Yeah, no, always educate. That's why I do stuff like this. That's why I come and, and, and fly out and get to talk to people like you. People think I come do it just to shoot the, the content. I do. The content's great. Content like, is like a side benefit. But like the stuff that we, you know, the side conversations that we have, well, I'll overhear something you say. You might not even be talking to me, right? I might overhear something you say to Jamil about your guys' business and go, putting that in work, putting that to work tomorrow. Yeah. Right. So this, it's, that's why I love doing this. Isn't thing. it interesting you, you say that? It's like yeah. I, I posted on my Instagram today that I was going to sell or finance one of my trucks, mm -hmm. right? And I get somebody who replies to me on a DM because we've been doing a lot of creative finance car stuff on the YouTube yeah. channel lately. And so people are DMing me going, I bought a Honda Civic last week, sub two. I bought a to Toyota Tundra this week, sub two. I sold my Honda on seller finance. And I'm like, all you guys are just watching what I'm doing and just going and putting <laughs> yeah, it to work. It's yeah. freaking insane awesome. how cool, like you could go from sitting there in that moment going, okay, I know I want to get financially free. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to watch a Ted talk. What's this guy talking about? Passive this passive that. And then all of a sudden fast forward, people are learning from you yeah, how to go and implement and put yeah. things into action and changing their lives. Absolutely. It's bonkers to me, dude. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like it's my responsibility. Dude, you got the information. You remember exactly how useless you felt when your when your lender on your own personal house was like, um, yeah, you need yeah. to get your ass off this loan so your wife can buy her dream house. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you don't want anybody to feel that that useless. So you, you have um, mentorship stuff? Yes, absolutely. What do, you, what do you got? I've got a mentorship program. I teach my students. I'm in front of my students once a week, and then I have three coaches who are in front of them once a week as well. So... We got four calls a week that we do in my mentorship program. There's Love no it. excuse for my students not to be knocking deals out of the park because we're there in their face all the time. It's about accountability with us. Yeah, We're on the call and we're saying, where are you at? Where are you at with your progress this week? I can see where they're at in my curriculum. Like I can track it. I know if they're going through it or not. Right. And if they're not implementing, we're holding you accountable. I love it. And well, guys, we'll put information and, and links for, for Henry so you guys can connect with him down below. He doesn't have a YouTube channel yet, but he's going to have a YouTube channel at some point in the oh, future. Yeah. I can yeah. I can see it. He's currently on On the Market with Jamil Damji, Kathy Fetke, and you've got Data Deli Dave. Data Deli Dave and old, old Jimmy John, James Dannard. And, and amazing, amazing group. I love yeah. that you guys created a whole second channel just to talk about what's going on in the market with different strategies. Very, very cool. So guys, we're gonna talk about Henry Washington's first deal in the next video. And then what we'll do is we'll follow it up with another video, um, a topic I love talking about that I never get to talk about with Jamil, which is why is direct to seller superior to everything else, um, especially for my personality. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in the next video. <laughs>